All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Ann Kinseth, and I am the Director of Education at the Meadows Museum. And we're so happy that you are joining us for Movies with the Meadow, a spotlight on Pedro Almodovar. Before we get started, I have just a few um, housekeeping uh, notes. First of all, I want to make sure you all know that we are recording this session. It's our hope that we will be able to post this on the museum's um, YouTube channel. Um, and so we are recording. Second, you'll notice that as you've joined, your microphone is on mute. And that's just to make sure that we're not picking up any um, unnecessary background noise. So we ask that you keep yourself on mute throughout the presentation. And I will be happy to mute um, microphones as needed throughout uh, the talk tonight. Um, finally, I want to let you know how we're handling questions. So we will invite you to open the chat function of Zoom and type your questions there. You can do that throughout the talk. And at the end, um, we've saved some time for Q&A, and I will be happy to um, share those questions with our speaker. So with that, um, I am so pleased to introduce Dr. Constantine. What, baby? Oh. Can we watch? Oh, yeah, the remote's closed. There we go. I am so happy uh, to introduce Dr. Constantine Iklanu. He is a lecturer of Spanish and the first year Spanish language coordinator here at Southern Methodist University. He's obtained, or he obtained his PhD from the University of Kentucky in 2017 with a specialization in the representation of immigrants within the Spanish media. His dissertation focused on immigrant voices in political speech, music, and film, and their efficacy in garnering empathy for their cause. He recently completed the translation of Isaac Rosa's short story, Occidental Traits, and published a chapter on graphic novels and post-Spanish Civil War violence in Ghosts of Power. Um, and the title translates as Identity, Repetition, and Trauma, the Violence in Homes for Abandoned Children in Todo Paraguayas. Dr. Iklanu also specializes in Spanish film more, um, more generally and has felt that the cinema of Pedro Almodovar has always been an exciting uh, avenue of, for exploration. So with that, I am pleased to now turn the presentation over to Dr. Iklanu. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, first and foremost, I wanted to thank the Meadows Museum of Art and especially uh, Anne for setting up this wonderful opportunity to watch and delve into some of the work of Pedro Almodovar and his in incredible uh, cinematographic career. I also wanted to thank all of you uh, <clears throat> for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to be here as I know we are all extremely busy. All right. Um, what did I want to do with this presentation, right? Fully covering Almodovar in detail would not be fitting for this venue, right? His, his work is extensive and that we just could not do that. So I have decided instead to focus on what I found most engaging in the three films we have chosen for the movies with the meadows. That is the role of fragmented identity in revealing the more serious side of Almodovar's films. Thus, in uh, this presentation, I will analyze the reoccurrence of history in women on the verge of a, break, a nervous breakdown, the skin I live in, and I am so excited uh, to describe how fragmented identities set in motion seemingly unsolvable dramas that protagonists overcome by coming to terms with the impossibility of a neat conclusion to their dilemmas. That is, coming to terms with the fragment, accepting that uh, not all questions in life uh, have clear cut and singular answers. Thus, the happy endings in these films are surprising and unexpected, yet a reflection of optimism uh, that flows uh, from, that flows, uh, that follows the upward trajectory of rights in Spain after the death of the fascist dictator El Generalísimo Francisco Franco. Furthermore, in the course of this presentation, we'll also see how perverse desire rules lives both at the political as well as at the personal level in what I consider a critique that Almodovar makes to Spain's still lingering sense 
of the white Catholic heterosexual triumvirate. Um, Pedro Almodovar uh, needs no introduction, as you can uh, see there, there's an introduction. However, I feel compelled uh, at least to run through some of his uh, major accomplishments in explaining the cultural milieu uh, in which he began his career. So he's born in Calzada de Calatrava in 1949. At 16 years old, he decides to move to Madrid, uh, where he gets a job as an administrator in the company Telefonica. This employment uh, comes to be represented constantly in his film with an obsession with scenes that include telephones, phone booths, and phone conversations that misfire, are overheard, or act as important points in the plot of his films. <clears throat> While working uh, for the Telefonica company in the 70s, he starts experimenting with recording films on a Super 8 camera. He collaborates with a variety of magazines and theater pro productions and begins obtaining some incipient fame. However, as Kirchner reminds us, and I quote, it is important to remember that among contemporary Spanish directors, Almodovar is not a product of film school or even of a fine arts education but is self-taught. He learned his craft experimenting with a Super 8 camera and watching movies, right? So this is uh, pretty promising uh, to any aspiring filmmakers uh, here. Uh, you too can uh, get there. <laughs> In fact, Almodovar himself sees this lack of a formal education as a positive and a reason for his nonconformist originality. In an interview with Strauss, he mentions, the eclecticism of my films is natural, instinctive. No doubt because I never had an academic education, because I never went to film school. I've always rema uh, remained undisciplined and free. I think he's being very uh, generous with himself because um, when he says undisciplined, that does not show in his films. His films are very disciplined and very well put together. His knowledge of art and intertextual references with other films and other um, yeah, cultural artifacts is extensive. Uh, and uh, I think he's totally right in that, right? His films show innovations and an unbridled spirit that is nurtured by his nonconformism. Yet, they're not simply frivolous sex comedies, but in reality are driven by much more serious topics. That's kind of the, the point of this presentation is to delve into some of these more serious topics and see how they all come together and how they are contextualized. So um, what I wanted to mention also is that uh, he's not, uh, this is not the regular way uh, film directors become famous in Spain. And I'm gonna give you just a little bit of history about this. Uh, in 1947, during the harshest period of the dictatorship in Spain, the Instituto de Investigaciones y Experiencias Cinematográficas, which is like a film school, uh, which later gets renamed in 1961 as Escuela Oficial de Cinematografía, which is translated as the official school of cinema, is created to produce a very polished and acceptable uh, by the fascist government, as well as outsiders, right, uh, to create this polished film, Spanish film industry. Furthermore, in 1984, uh, is passed what is called La Ley Miro, uh, which only funds films that are up to European quality standards and they have a, a certain look, right? They're trying to bring to the top and fund only the best Spanish films so they can get access to an international market. Uh, these schools um, that I mentioned earlier and this law, the, the Ley Miro, uh, made very difficult uh, for experimental or French cinema to come to light in Spain. Now, Almodovar's film is that, is experimental and is not part of this, you know, educated school type thing, right? Now, that is only until the Movida hits. Right, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about the Movida. In the late 70s, and more prominently in the, in the beginning of the 80s, uh, and after the death of the Spanish uh, Francisco Franco, let me, let me switch that, there we go. After the death of 
uh, Francisco Franco in 75, Spain experiences a rapid, a rapid economic growth as well as an explosion of old repressed anger, angst, sexual frustration. Recreational use of drugs, the flaunting of taboos, and spiting the conservatives becomes the rage of an ex-marginalized youth seeking to piece together a new identity for the Spanish psyche. The music scene flourishes and bands like Siniestro Total, and I fully recommend, by the way, if you're interested in fun music, especially kind of punk rock style music, uh, go and check these out. Uh, so bands like Siniestro Total, Radio Futura, Radio Futura, Alaska, Mecano, and then, and this is the, uh, the surprise, Almodovar himself and McNamara, um, they form a band and they lead uh, this cultural movement uh, entitled La Movida. Uh, the music is very much a countercultural um, uh, that seeks to shock and wake up the older generations that pretended that the Franco dictatorships, the dictatorship was absolutely normal. And take, for example, uh, the song that I'm going to play for you. It's called Voy a Ser Mama uh, by Almodovar and McNamara, uh, which he, his name is really Fabio de Miguel. But let me show you the song. And I've made a, a rough translation of the lyrics over here so you can see uh, the shock value uh, as well as the critiques that Almodovar is making um, to the Spanish society. So I'm going to play this. I hope it works. Uh, let me know when if it doesn't. También Pedro Almodóvar revolucionó el panorama del cine independiente y se lo pasó bien cantando con Mandamara. This is Pedro Almodovar, by the way, in case uh, you didn't know. All right, we're going to stop it here. Uh, but I just wanted to give you guys a taste of his music and the counterculture uh, style of music that was popular at that moment, um, which makes sense, right? They just came from this period of intense authoritarianism where um, you know, in the early, in the 40s and 50s, uh, any dissent was uh, punished severely, oftentimes with death. Um, so uh, this repression, when it comes out and it explodes onto the scene, which uh, starts in Madrid and then moves on uh, throughout Spain that they call La Movida. But you can see how, even though these lyrics may seem, right, they're obviously, you know, shocking, they are ironic, uh, yet they are very uh, powerful and they do offer quite a bit of critique um, to the uh, right more conservative uh, Spaniards, right? The value of motherhood, um, abortion or keeping the baby, not allowing those things, uh, and then not aborting the baby in order to, you know, end them and living off prostitution or whatever, right? So you can see how they're like serious social critiques here even though it appears kind of like, oh, this is comedy. Here are these two gay men pretending to be women and they're saying these most crazy things, right? All right, <clears throat> um, let's see here. Okay, 
So notice that despite the lack of mention of Franco or his dictatorships, the lyrics are directly atta attacking a society that prohibited abortion, but subtly promoted prostitution and murdered those that opposed the system with impunity in the early years of the dictatorship. Thus, under the guise of comedy and laughter, Almodovar and McNamara exemplarily address social injustices with irony and shock. Okay, so this is kind of my, my thesis of, um, of Almodovar's films. And then let me move on here. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, last in this um, milieu, in, the, uh, in order to contextualize Almodovar and his films, uh, I wanted to address uh, this pact of forgetting um, in my talk as well. So before we move on to the films of Almodovar, there's one more element of the Spanish culture of the 1980s um, that has to be mentioned in order to make sense of why La Movida and Almodovar do not directly attack the old Franco regime and why his films are so fragmentary. This has to do uh, with what has come to be called La Ley del Olvido, or the Ley of Forgetfulness, um, which is an actual law. It's called Ley de Amnistia en España uh, de 1977, which means Law of Amnesty uh, in Spain that is signed in 1977. This is two years after the death of Francisco Franco. At the moment, there were lots of political prisoners uh, on the left. Uh, and people were in the streets protesting and asking for these people to be released from prison. Um, and the government came up with a decision uh, that yes, they would do that, but only if by releasing these uh, prisoners, they would also give amnesty to all the old uh, Franco collaborators um, and, you know, ex-torturers and other such things, right? So this law uh, allowed the democracy in Spain to flourish, but put a lid on being able to try in courts of law criminals, torturers and the like. Culturally, this law also has profound and had profound effects uh, where films and musics, that, uh, the music that appeared to be aloof and only deal with the if ephemeral questions rather than address concrete uh, troubles uh, facing Spain. All the three films uh, in our Meadows uh, Museum uh, series uh, for this, uh, for this uh, series address this topic, right, uh, indirectly because of this. Um, and then I wanted to show you another clip. Uh, this is from uh, a film called The Silence of Others that is produced by Almodovar, um, <clears throat> but, but directed by Almudena uh, Caracedo and uh, Robert Barr. So let me play to you just from minute six uh, to seven uh, to hear how this law is passed and what it entails. Give me just one second. Minute six. There we go. La izquierda luchó por una amnistía para liberar a los presos políticos. Y pensaron que lo habían conseguido. Pero la nueva ley también concedió la amnistía a todos los crímenes de la dictadura. Se le vino a llamar el Pacto del Olvido. Es simplemente un olvido. Una amnistía de todos para todos. Un olvido de todos para todos. Una ley puede establecer el olvido. Pero ese olvido ha de bajar a toda la sociedad. Hemos de procurar que esta concepción del olvido se vaya generalizando, porque es la única manera de que podamos darnos la mano sin rencor. Los que crecimos después de Franco no sabemos lo que ocurrió realmente. All right. um, so there is a little bit of um, the pact of forgetting and how it was uh, signed into law 
um, and its implications, right? So this becomes a forced uh, forgetting. And this is very powerful, right? Because in being forced to forget, right? It's like trying to repress a memory. It's always going to be on the tip of your tongue. It's always going to be there in the back, yet you can't address it, right? This is pretty much like the definition of trauma, right? This instills and formalizes trauma in, in the Spanish society. Uh, let me, there we go. Okay, so <clears throat> this is, this law, right, becomes a big reason why La Movida Madrileña and implicitly many of the films of Almodovar, and this is my assertion, right, uh, appear apolitical, ephemeral, and aloof. Notice how Russo uh, qualifies Almodovar's work. He says, each of Almodovar's films has created an alternative world based in political reality, but transformed by crackpot, sometimes surreal fantasies of the way life should be in an amoral society. And, and I quote, in the last three years, Almodovar has emerged as the singular voice of the Spanish cinema, the personification and spiritual father of La Movida, the all-purpose phrase coined in Madrid to signify life after Franco, sexual freedom, punk rockers, sunshine, uh, great food, good times, and the general explosion of creative expression that a nation experiences when moving from a dark past of repression into the light of freedom. Lastly, Cadalso also has something similar, uh, a similar analysis of Almodovar's work. He says, uh, his uncontrolled and colorful films found a receptive audience in a population that was eager for spontaneity and light, for new stimuli that could uh, again bring joy to living. Right, so they all kind of acknowledge, right, this history that it's there. However, they prefer to view Almodovar uh, as just, you know, eschewing all that and being uh, offering a different reality, right? I'm not sure, right, how perfectly accurate all this is, but uh, this is how many academics have approached um, all of our films. I personally, feel, I personally think that uh, this characterization has more to do with the impossibility of speech uh, on this subject in Spain, an impossibility that allows progress, but fragments and hurts rather than uh, heal and make whole. Russo continues, uh, from the beginning, he has said, right, Almodovar has said repeatedly that his work and his films are meant to deny even the memory of Franco by creating a world in which the disenfranchised are able to be masters and especially mistresses of their own dignity. I personally have many reasons to believe that this is not a closed case as it may appear to be uh, because many, many directors, when they talk about their films, uh, eschew categorizations and would rather let their viewers come to their own conclusions rather than, uh, you know, a director be boxed into a genre and message and say, this is social film. You can only interpret it one way, right? Directors do not want that. Uh, thus, this is comprehensible and understandable for any self-respecting uh, artist. That said, accepting the film is apolitical or amoral is simply watching the films with your eyes shut. Ideology is always present and representation is not accidental. Um, I believe this background is necessary in order to contextualize the cinematography and choices Almodovar makes with his films. His films have received a lot of praise and he is a prolific director. He has directed, uh, sorry, let me go back, uh, 21 films in the 40 years uh, between 1980 and, and 2020 and has played as an actor in more than seven films. He was nominated for five Oscars uh, and won two Oscars for Todo Sobre Mi Madre, All About My Mother and Able Con Ella, Speak to Her. Um, furthermore, he's won uh, four BAFTA, which are kind of like the Oscars in uh, England um, and received 10 Goyas, also like the Oscars, but in Spain, awards among an almost uncountable uh, other wins and nominations at other festivals. Uh, in 1986, he funds the production film company El Deseo, uh, which means the desire, which is very aptly named because desire plays such an important role in his films. Uh, he's truly a consummate success. 
right? An image of puzzling perfection reflecting a fragmented society disposed to forget. So now let's, uh, let's delve into uh, women on the verge of a nervous breakdown, the skin I live in, and I'm so excited, uh, and observe some of the traits um, and how they connect with uh, what I've said um, earlier. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, the opening sequence, and these are kind of keys uh, to a lot of his films. Uh, the opening sequences of his films uh, give a lot of clues as to uh, what he's doing. Um, so the opening sequence of women on the verge of a nervous breakdown uh, is very telling. At first we observe a set of collages in flat and somewhat muted colors, reminding of an evolved art deco or pop art style, reminiscent of Andy Warhol's collages representing the fragmented nature of the self. We see body parts, we see eyes, lips, legs, hands, and jewelry. We also see the production company El Deseo and the title of the film, Mujeres al Borde de un Ataque de Nervios, or Women on the, um, uh, on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown. Um, and uh, we also see at 40 second mark, we see Mujeres. You've got this big title and it's got these women that are next to the letters indicating that this is a film about women. Uh, and there's an interesting connection here uh, with the poet uh, Federico Garcia Lorca, who is also homosexual and who wrote about women. Uh, unlike Almodovar though, Lorca was executed by Franco's men uh, for his sexual nonconformity. Uh, at minute uh, 148, we see uh, scissors cutting the eye um, cutting an eye. There's a strip uh, of photos uh, and there's a scissor appearing to cut the eye. This image is reminiscent of the exceptionally famous uh, Luis Buñuel's first picture, Un Chien Andalou, uh, and the special effects used in cutting of the eye uh, in representation of the power of cinema to affect viewers. If you have never seen this, uh, don't stop now, but after the meeting, go and uh, look up Luis Buñuel, Un Chien Andalou. It's, uh, it's pretty shocking how realistic it looks, even though it's, you know, among the beginning of cinema. Um, we also see an introduction uh, of the flat, right, the apartment building where Pepa, which is played by Carmen Maura, lives. Uh, tellingly, we don't get the actual filming of an actual building in Madrid. Instead, we get an architectural maquette uh, in the form of a building where she lives to emphasize the fakeness of the film, as well as a representation of the um, illusory lives and the childish games of grown-ups in Spain. So this is key, right, um, in seeing how, even though we're, we're talking about adults, Everybody's got this, this life that is surreal and really crazy. People connect with each other. Uh, and then there's a lot of uh, cheating and problems, desires that are uh, never fulfilled or fulfilled too much, right? Uh, and that's, uh, that's some of that. Then we, are, uh, we see Ivan uh, and he tells uh, in a narrator's voice, Pepa Carino, no quería oírte nunca decir soy infeliz, right? Which is Pepa, my love, I never wanted to hear you say I am unhappy. Uh, this uh, is all played over the opening song by Lola Beltran, a Mexican singer best known for, uh, best known as Lola La Grande, uh, as and also the queen of mariachi. Uh, Beltran is also famous for her extravagant costumes and ornate jewelry. Now. I want to play just a little bit so you can see uh, what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna have to switch somehow what I'm sharing. Give me just one moment. Okay, women, there we go. Uh, one moment. And so notice, pay attention to the, the fragmented, right? We've got scratches, we've got disembodied uh, body parts. Uh, here we have the mujeres, right, with the women, and the title of the film, obviously. Mm -hmm. 
I noticed the collage, um, the pop art style. Um, and then I want to move just a little bit ahead. Just a little bit. Here's the flat that is just a El mundo se hundía a mi alrededor y yo quería salvarme y salvarlo. Me sentía como Noé. En el corral que instalé en la terraza me hubiera gustado tener una pareja de todas las especies animales. En cualquier caso, no conseguí salvar la pareja que más me interesaba. La mía. Pepa, cariño, no quiero oírte nunca decir soy infeliz. Tú y va. And so here we have images of clocks, and there's Ivan and Peppa, and he says how much he loves her. And yet here's Peppa uh, destroyed. Right? And this is what she dreams, and this is an important uh, image. This is an important image of maleness and machismo. Uh, which is something that Almodovar always critiques, right? So as you see this, right, nothing seems out of the ordinary, yet I think that there's a lot of um, deeper message that is being portrayed. So this is the man. Mi vida sin ti no tiene sentido. ¿Quieres casarte noches no serían suficientes. No puedo vivir sin ti. Te quiero, te deseo, te necesito. Aquella noche en la selva fue maravillosa. ¿Por qué no nos casamos por segunda vez? ¿no? Eres la geisa de mi vida, Sayonara. No me importa el éxito si tú estás a mi lado. Estoy dispuesto a aceptarte como eres. Mi vida hay cosas inequívocamente americanas. Estoy a tu disposición. Te acepto como eres, cariño. Pues mira qué bien. <laughs> All right. Um, then we switch on to uh, what Ivan does, right? So. Uh, Ivan is, um, he does subtitles, not, not subtitles, what am I saying, voiceovers uh, for films. Uh, and you will see something very important here to uh, Almodovar and understanding, right, the more political message of these films. Uh, notice first how man is portrayed, right? Man is um, interested in all these women without really caring about the women, right? Uh, he sees all these different women, and as soon as one is different, he's interested in her uh, without giving any mention to uh, or thought to the previous uh, women to whom he promised himself or gave a compliment. Right? Notice now as his jobs what we see. And pay attention to this uh, uh, extreme close up of the microphone and his mouth. Um, again, disembodied parts, right? Fragments, and how these fragments are meaningful, yet they're not connected, they're not together. Um, and notice more this uh, fragmented self uh, as I continue to play this a little bit more. ¿A cuántos hombres has tenido que olvidar? Dime algo agradable. Engáñame. Dime que siempre me has esperado. Dímelo. All right. Um, I want to go back just right here, let's say. Um, and I wanted to mention about this scene, uh, which I find very interesting. Uh, and let me uh, get to my notes. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we have an extreme close up of Ivan's mouth speaking to a microphone. This image cuts to a muted film scene 
uh, where Ivan does, does voiceovers. Interesting to be noted here is that Ivan is doing the voice of the man whose mouth movements are out of sync with Ivan's recording, right? In a way, Ivan covers what is being said with a narration that is impossible to know whether it's trustworthy or not, right? Where the self, wishes, body, and desires are translated through his male gaze and voice, right? So we're taking what exists and we're transferring that through a voice over, right? A covering of something, right? Think about the Pacto del Olvido, right? The, the Pact of Forgetfulness, how film and music are covering all these other things. However, they're still there, right? There's something to be covered. Um, furthermore, under closer scrutiny, the image shows a very interesting post-processing technique. The dots you see on screen, and you can kind of see them over here, I'm not sure if the um, compression in the video shows it or not, but there are lines and dots here. Uh, the dots you see on screen are associated with stills in early newspaper production, and this is uh, a skill called a halftone. Um, they are meant, halftone is meant to be used in order to show depth uh, by displaying gradients in a medium uh, where uh, a normal wood carving would not uh, have allowed for the job, right? So the halftone pattern has no business uh, being in a film. A right? halftone only reflects newspaper um, and it's meant to show a gradient, right, between just black and just white. Rather, we have black, but because of these dots and how they're spaced, they allow for uh, gradients. So, um, in a moving picture, halftone makes no sense. Yet Almodovar uses this halftone, and again, nothing in film is accidental, right? He uses this halftone pattern to both match the texture of the microphone displayed earlier, and also to show how without design tricks, the depth of the characters is completely flat, unchanging and problematic. A further note is that the female voice is utterly missing from the voiceover, implying again that men have all the power in these relationships, right? So uh, as, as, as you've seen, right, when, when, the women, when the woman was speaking, nobody was there. And the reason why nobody was there is because uh, Peppa, right, the woman we saw earlier on the bed, was supposed to be there. She was supposed to do the other voice, <clears throat> but because she is distraught emotionally, because Ivan is cheating on her with somebody else, she's in bed and she's taking some medicine. Anyway, <clears throat> this is the beginning of the film, and this sets um, a lot of the, of the, of the scenes and the, the craziness that happens throughout the film, uh, as I'm sure you're familiar uh, with the film. It, but it gives that craziness, uh, it, it, it anchors it to something that is historical and to something that um, covers up something else. I'm not gonna go any further detail even though there's so much here. Uh, however, I did want to mention that um, these brief 10 minutes show how fragmented and broken lives of the protagonists of Almodovar are. Right? Peppa is suffering from an unfaithful relationship. Ivan is in many relationships and is constantly running away from the women he cheats with. He is interested, um, he's an interesting case, right? Obviously, as he seems not to bear the blame, right? That's how Almodovar seems, makes, it, makes it seem. He's more of a representation of culture, of machismo in general, a force that acts without thought, a culture that has been forced to forget, yet cannot but desire more. This desire and the inability to uh, remember fragments causes damage and leads to violence, right? The repressed and the lied women rise up out of the stupor, right? And reclaim what is theirs in different ways, right? Some of the women use words uh, and actions, others use guns. <laughs> uh, some uh, are sane and some are not but they are powerful, right? This is the me message that I see um, that is not all games and not all, uh, not all games, right, end in laughter, right? Not all comedies like this one appears to be just a simple comedy. 
and that um, people in power need to mind those that they abuse if they are not ready to deal with their consequences. Right? Later in the film, uh, we get uh, to see Carlos, which is played by Antonio Banderas, uh, a very common actor in his films, uh, who is also a womanizer, uh, a womanizer, I call him a womanizer without a cause, who will seduce any woman he sees thus representing the perverse nature of cycles and connecting uh, with uh, the earlier song, right, that we saw, Voy a Ser Mama. Good. Uh, so that's just a little bit about uh, Almodovar, the history, and um, Mujeres al Borde uh, de un Ataque de Nervios, or Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown. The other two films uh, that I have also prepared, The Skin I Live In, and I'm so excited, I am not sure how much we'll get to, but they also portray very uh, interesting. Um, and similarly, they have frivolous combined with uh, very serious, especially the skin I live in, right? This uh, is a much more uh, serious, and let me skip back to the presentation. One moment. There we go. So here's the skin I live in uh, and a little bit about it. <clears throat> um, uh, it has also some similar traits that stand out. It is um, a reimagining of a 120 page French novel called Migal uh, by, and I'm going to butcher this name because my French is terrible, uh, la the late Thierry Jonquet. Uh, in which an eminent French plastic surgeon has a practice in a public hospital in Paris and also a private clinic in uh, Boulogne, uh, a, a secret operating theater in the basement of his suburban mansion. A beautiful um, submissive uh, partner called Eve with whom he uh, keeps under lock and key and a teenage daughter in an asylum, right? So, uh, if you've seen the film, this is very similar to what's happening in um, uh, in the skin I live in, right? Um, okay, uh, what are some of the critiques, right? First, the title reflects a multitude of levels of depths in the film. First, it hints at the identity of the protagonist, right? Um, and this is what's, what's interesting about the protagonist here, because you could think that there could be multiple protagonists. However, the real protagonist is uh, what, what I call the binom uh, Vicente and Vera, which is this, uh, this character right here. Uh, the, the protagonist is subverted and instead of acting, is acted upon throughout the film, right? Like culture acts upon its slaves, right? Us, it shapes and molds them. The binom Vicente Vera, hardly speaks and acts. Uh, instead, it assumes, follows, and is molded, right? Secondarily, the title uh, reflects uh, to the director himself, right? It both denounces and affirms the duality of the individual between the body and the mind. The body being forced to suffer, aged, uh, be attracted and attacked uh, in opposition to the will of the mind, right? Sexuality and attraction that do not conform to heteronormativity are forced on some by nature in ways that defy the will of the individual, right? And this connects directly here with this film. Uh, in the film, The Skin I Live In, uh, touches on this subject and how an outside force uh, is able to abduct and forcefully change the protagonist's sex and body image. What's more is that the binome Vicente Vera, right, this character, accepts this transition and appears comfortable with it, right? Despite, right, the fact that he tries to escape. Uh, yes, in the, the film appears to be a tragedy when Robert, which is Antonio Banderas, kills his brother, Seca, and then Vera, or Vicente, right, is able to escape by killing Robert, her creator, right, the god, right, and also the mother of his creator, uh, which you could say that this is a, a simile to, um, right, Jesus or God and the Virgin Mary. Um, she, the creation, the creation that has been perverted, changed against um, his or her will, is able to then kill 
um, you know, the, the father figure and uh, the mother figure here. However, when Vera goes back, right, when the uh, Vera Vicente go back to the mother's sewing shop, which also is a tie-in to uh, the sewing of her skin, right? Changing her um, sex and body entirely, right? When she goes back to her mother and reveals that he is Vicente, Vicente or Vera does not try to go back, right? She is who she is now and she will have to live in this condition, right? As Robert has created, right? As made her for him. Uh, and this is another bitter critique of the culture that molds us and affects us in a way that are irrecuperable, right? Culture shatters us, cuts us up, makes us fragments. Then we have to piece ourselves together in a way that makes sense. Again, we see how the binome Vicente Vera uh, or the victim, however, nobody's really a victim in Almodovar's films, um, despite being acted upon, cheated, captured, transformed unwillingly, does not do it in silence, but revolts, and in the end achieves his or her uh, freedom through violence. This violence was first directed at him or herself, right, when she tries to kill herself, um, uh, when no other means of escape existed, right? Like in Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, men are represented as powerful with women in initial secondary positions of subservience. They commit suicide, they are seduced, like in the case of Gal, Robert's wife, running away with Zeka and his daughter Norma, committing suicide after thinking her own father raped her. The women, however, mistreated as they are represented, gain a voice and in the end survive despite the fragmented selves they are forcefully given. The film really delves into the complexity of gender and sexuality in a way that is very thought provoking uh, and is worthy of serious analysis. Um, and I would invite you to uh, rewatch and rewatch the film and uh, see all these uh, really interesting moments. So I'm not going to get into, I'm all excited because we're running out of time. So I'm going to just sum it up. To sum it all up, all these three films discussed in this presentation are not simply as Instorf puts it, and I quote, uh, many of Pedro Almodovar's movies begin with dazzling scenes uh, that self-consciously reflect the Spanish director's delight in artifice. They also address political topics, the economy, sexual identity, fragmentation, and expose a culture on the verge of a nervous breakdown. In an existential manner, all these films show how not much matters but everything has consequences that despite the apparent frivolous nature of Almodovar's films, all these things do matter. Uh, Smith retells that Almodovar feels, and I quote, Spain's pain in numerous uh, interviews. He claimed that comedy would be a healing balm to a crisis wracked country that feels, uh, that, that feels the need to laugh, right? And he does so in his films. He, however, is not simply a comedian and also addresses very serious issues. He observes afflicting the Spanish identity post-Franco as informed by history and unsolved trauma. And this concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you all for your time and I really appreciate all of you being here and I'm gonna pass the time back to Anne. Thank you so much. Fascinating. Um, I'm going to invite everyone to share any questions that you might have in the chat box. Um, we have one already, so I'm going to go ahead and get, get Dr. Iklanu started with that. So Jillian, um, when you were speaking about women on, a, a, or women on a, the verge of a nervous breakdown, noted that um, Ivan walks along um, the Banyo Arabe, I think the Turkish baths, and she's wondering if you think it's intentional symbolism or if it was just something common in the 1980s. Uh, I think that it is intentional. I am a firm believer that things in film, uh, because it takes so long to prepare and there's a script and there are um, lots of things that go together to make a film, right? Film is not spontaneous. You just pick up a camera and film a film, right? You have to have script and you have to have storyboards and you have to practice, you have to take multiple takes. So no, I'm not a, uh, a believer that that is unintentional. Uh, now, how could it be relevant? I think um, as you saw all the women that he passes by, 
um, are different somehow. They're either from a different culture, different race, um, different religion, right? He makes some comments that are clearly not <laughs> right, right? Like he talks to the African woman and he says, well, if we marry each other the second time, right? Meaning he acknowledges, right, polygamy uh, in uh, Western Africa. And uh, yeah, he talks to the, to the Asian woman also in a demeaning way. But I mean, he talks to all the women in a demeaning way. So yeah, I think that it's connected to the exoticism of woman, right? So you've got man who is um, a symbol of macho, of a culture that is sick. Um, and then he sees women also through stereotype, right? And the place kind of emphasizes that. Thank you. Okay, we have another question. Um, this one from Julie. And this is about the film that um, unfortunately we ran out of time um, for you to discuss about I'm so excited. So um, she is curious about the difference between first class and economy and whether, so this film takes place almost entirely on an airplane. Um, and so she's wondering if there might be a commentary there on social class and Additionally, is the sleeping in the economy class part of this pact of forgetting, or would you link those? I love that. I think that is a wonderful question. And yes, I think there's totally uh, something very meaningful there. Um, the way I interpret it, and if you look at most of his films, at least the films that we've seen right now, they do not deal with the uh, lower classes. In fact, most people that are represented in these films are either doctors, successful actors, um, or the first class. And in the first class, we have all these perverse people, right? They're either uh, cheating on the economy or sleeping with like a luxury prostitute or uh, a murder, right? A, a henchman, <laughs> right? And uh, then all these people in the higher classes act. They have a voice, they say things, they rebel, they have all sorts of things that mean something, even though the plane is going in circles, emphasizing meaninglessness. Now the, the other class, right, the, the economy or coach, uh, we have people there that are unconscious. Uh, that is interesting, right, because um, I think that's a social critique that the masses are sleeping, right? We are going in circles as an economy. There is a first class of people that are acting. They're sleeping with the, uh, they're sleeping with the presidents and with the prime ministers and even with the king, right? That's what she implies. Uh, there are people who are swindling the economy and we, the middle class, are sleeping. We, the coach class, are all asleep. When the people in the first class have a need, have a desire, what do they do? They come to the sleepy class and take without asking, right? Uh, we've got the, the lady who is a, a medium, right? And she's a virgin and she says all these crazy things. When she feels that it's time for her to get a man, she just goes to the second class, right? To the, uh, to the coach and just sleeps with this man who is unconscious, right? Which obviously, right, is a critique of how the upper class is, <laughs> I'm trying not to use the F word here, is effing us, right? And we are just asleep and letting them do it. So that's kind of how I see it. Um, but yeah, I think that's another very important message there. Great. Okay, another question. This is from Nusha. She is wondering if you could talk more about the significance of each of Ivan's lover in women on the verge of a, of a nervous bro breakdown? Hmm. The significance of each of his lovers. Uh, the lovers are of different ages uh, that we see. I, I'm not sure, Nusha, if you're referring to the scene that we've seen where he meets all the different women from different places, or if you're talking about the uh, women he actually um, has relationships with in the, in the actual film. So if you can clarify that, that would make a difference. Um, and the relationships in the actual film. In the actual film. Okay, so there we have this woman that is uh, unhinged, right? She's, she's crazy, uh, but she's made crazy by him. Uh, and she, is, she represents 
I think, right? She represents um, the people that have been maddened by um, the abuse of the people in power, right? And she uh, loses her mind that she has this baby, Carlos, uh, which a baby, it's a, it's a man now, uh, that we meet who's also a womanizer, um, who's about to be engaged with this lady, yet he does anything and kisses anybody that he sees. Um, and then you've got Peppa, which is a coworker, uh, and then you also have the woman who's a lawyer. So in all these instances he goes through, whoever he sees, Ivan, uh, he also <laughs> ends up sleeping with them. Um, and the significance of all of them, I don't know if uh, they're all, at least I haven't gotten to, uh, to fully uh, express that, but I think that they're all different and they emphasize different aspects of, um, of ways in which uh, the powerful um, deal with us. And, you know, these women just sleep with him. In the end, they, they try to kill him, which is at least one of them. Uh, which rise, she rises up. So there are consequences to it, but it mostly to the impunity. I'm not sure if I fully answered that question. I'm sorry. Well, I think um, we have two more questions. The next one I'm actually going to answer to give you a, a, a brief pause, and then we'll we'll kind of um, wrap up with the final question. So Michael was curious if the Meadows Museum was going to be doing more of these kind of conversations and, and talks on films. And um, I have noticed that there's a lot of people attending tonight that might be new to the to the Meadows Museum, which is really exciting for us. We welcome you all. We are a museum um, devoted to the art and culture of Spain. We're located on, located on Southern Methodist University's campus. Um, and we are planning, I'm right now working on our spring um, calendar of programming. And so it will include some more um, kind of focus, foci, on, on film, so you can look out for those um, in the spring. But until then, um, let me kind of give our, our last uh, question. Um, so uh, Jillian is wondering, if you are a fan of Almodovar and you've seen most of his films, kind of what re re directors would you recommend turning to next? If you are a fan of Almodovar, what director should you turn to next? Um, hmm. Well, I'm gonna give you an easy answer, but an awesome director, which is Luis Buñuel. Um, Luis Buñuel is the other uh, director of Spanish cinema that is, I would say he's more famous. Uh, his films are also fragmentary and surrealist and very strange, um, but absolutely amazing. Uh, so yes, I recommend uh, go with Luis Buñuel. Uh, that will be a very fruitful endeavor. Uh, a lot of the films are like uh, older. However, um, I don't think that that makes them old or um, yeah, uncomplex, right? They're extremely complex and very, very fun. So I recommend, yeah, Luis Buñuel. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Iklunu, thank you so much for putting together um, such not just a fantastic lecture, but he actually selected the films that we covered tonight. So he curated the series um, itself. So I wanna thank you so much on behalf of the Meadows Museum for what, what you have given all of us tonight. And I wanna thank all of you that took some time out of your Thursday evening and some more time out of your life to watch the films. Thank you all for joining us. Um, please visit the Meadows Museum's website. We have many more programs going on um, this fall and, and new ones that will be released for the spring, and we hope to see you back again. Take care.